morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody again. Our, uh, our Pastor Tom is uh, Pastor Tom's on vacation this week, so uh, he asked me if I would uh, if I would come and uh, lead service, and I uh, told him yes, yes, I will. I will lead the service. Um, I'm sure many of you know by my history of doing this that uh, I'm a somewhat awkward man, so please forgive me for that. Um, but um, I'm just I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful to see all of you in God's house today. Uh, do we have any any testimonies? Anything that the Lord has done for you that you'd like to share with this body of believers, whether this week or any time? I'll go ahead and start us off then. I, uh, I'm thankful that we, uh, we had the opportunity to go to the wilds yesterday, about, uh, about two hours north. And um, <clears throat> we, got to, we got to ride there and uh, just see all, all sorts of funny looking animals. And um, I think, uh, I think the, the best part of it was that Noah just really had a wonderful time. You know, he, sometimes he's, he's a little bit unruly and he likes to uh, he likes to really throw a fit, but man, he had a, he had a, a blast yesterday, and so I'm thankful that uh, that he was able to enjoy it as much as he was, and we were able to have a good time together as a family. Uh, do we have any other testimonies? I don't know if it's exactly a testimony or not, but I was glad to have my family. There was 11 of us, <laughs> 11 of us in the house at once, and uh, it's just like it was when the kids were little, only maybe a little worse. Everybody's waiting in line to take a shower. And, all those kind of things, but uh, I was glad to have them there, and my grandson stayed in with me. So. And then when they left, it felt like it was all the way on my island somewhere. <laughs> You know, uh, the family was, was was God's idea. You know, in, in the beginning, he, he created he created Adam, and then he said it's it's not good for man to be alone. And so, uh, whenever, when, yeah, whenever he, whenever whenever we see. Uh, Whenever we see situations for us to spend time with our family, uh, whether it's you know just at the house or you know going going on a trip somewhere or uh, enjoying enjoying God's creation outdoors, um, we should be thankful uh, for the time that God has granted us with with the people that are related to us, uh, either by blood or maybe even by marriage or whatever whatever circumstance. We have somebody that we consider as a family member, or even our friends. You know, we we have a variety of friends that we should be thankful for as well. And I consider every one of you in here um, a family in, in the in the Christian sense, but also a friend in the earthly sense as well. And so I'm thankful for all of you as well. Any other testimonies? For the Rob, I'm thankful to have Robin here this morning. Back with me. Amen. Glad she's feeling better. I thank God for his answered prayer and his provisions. Absolutely. All right. We'll go ahead and uh, open us up with a word of prayer then. And Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much for this time that you've given us. Um, we are thankful for this opportunity to gather as a body of believers. And Lord, um, we are thankful uh, for... As, as we mentioned in our testimonies, Lord, we are thankful for the families that we, that we have. Lord, for the time that you grant to us to spend with our families. And uh, Lord, in particular, um, uh, our sister has mentioned safe travels for her family. And Lord, I will also pray that for any of us that plan on making trips in the, in the, in the future, Lord, that you will guide us safely there our destination and bring us back home. Um, we, we thank you for all the times that you've done in the past, and Lord, we, we trust that you are able to do that for us in the future. And Lord, for our country, Lord, this country that was built upon Christian principles, Lord, it was built uh, upon pilgrims who, who fled from persecution because they wanted to worship their God rightly. Lord, we, we pray that this, this nation that has thrived for many, many years will continue to do so, Lord. Lord, we are in a tumultuous time right now. We have 
many people who want to have power um, or they want to have that power without thanking you or acknowledging you for it. And Lord, uh, we pray that for all of those people, uh, whenever you grant them positions of power, Lord, that they will glorify you for that power. And Lord, that they will govern in a Romans 13 sort of a way. Lord, they will be your deacon, as you said, through our Apostle Paul. Uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, this service that we're about to enter into uh, will be glorifying to you and you alone. Lord, it will be edifying for the Christian and it will be convicting for the non-believers that may be here with us today. Lord, I just pray that uh, all of this will be, as we say every single week, for your glory and yours alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, do we have any announcements? I don't. Uh, I don't have any in front of me. But uh, is there anything that uh, that we feel like we need to share with the church in terms of announcements? All right. And I know, uh, I know our pastor Tom put together an announcement, an announcements video for us as well. So if there's anything that needed to be mentioned and uh, none of us remembered, then it should uh, should be on our, on our YouTube and Facebook pages as well if you'd like to look at that. All right. Um, so. <coughs> The call to worship this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, verses uh, 15 through 17. And if you would, uh, please stand and we will, we will read these three verses together. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. And the word of God says, He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So at this time, let us sing more songs to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom all things hold together.
want to thank you so much for that cross, Lord, for the cross that you died on. And Lord, you did not stay dead, Lord. You resurrected from the dead to show us that you will do the same for every genuine believer in you. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us. And Lord, I just pray that this sermon from our, from our guest preacher uh, will be glorifying to you and you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. <clears throat> I want to thank you and Pastor Tom for inviting um, my wife and my mom um, to join the worship service this morning. Um, I have struggled with um, a tremendous debilitating battle with kidney disease over the last couple of weeks, or a couple of years, I'm sorry. And so standing is very difficult. And so do you mind if I sit this morning? Is that okay? All right. <laughs> it's kind of rabbinical. And so um, we'll, we'll do it this morning. I appreciate Pastor Tom. Um, I've known Tom Mullahan now for almost 20 years. And he's actually one of the most authentic, genuine people I think I've ever met on planet Earth. He is really who he, he is. He just, he's just Tom inside out. And, and I appreciate that about him. And so this morning for our sermon, I want to honor that kind of integrity to the Word of God and to our experience as Christians as we take a look this morning at something that is uniquely human. It is the... the the dance between our faith, fear, and doubt. I want you to think this morning of something that you really fear. Now, I'm not talking about fear of spiders and snakes. I'm not talking about fear of the dark, fear of flying. I want you to think in your heart about something that really gives you pause and that causes you to fear. It's one of those things that can keep you up at night. And I want you to just kind of exist there for a minute. In the New Testament alone, fear is mentioned over 142 times. I think our God knows our frame to address that 142 times. In the whole canon of Scripture, doubt is addressed another 72 times. So, how are we to approach our life when we hit something where our faith and experience are going along really well and everything is going along and, and we have a lot of symmetry in our life where our faith and our experience in life are informing each other and everything is going along really smoothly and all of a sudden our experience takes a right turn. And we come up against something that we have never experienced before. And it is something that is painful. And it is something that we, we, are, we are terrified about. And, and, and we doubt. It could be something that you experience personally. It could be a debilitating condition. It could be something where you face your own mortality. That will give you pause. 
I thought that that was the hardest thing that I had experienced in my life. We're going to be genuine this morning, folks. I'm not going to pull any punches. Until five weeks ago. My wife went into the hospital, and she was supposed to have routine rotator cuff repair surgery. Now, we knew that there was going to be a period of, of pain with that. Everybody told us that that was going to hurt. <clears throat> and that the rehabilitation was going to be difficult. But she also has an artificial heart valve, and so after the surgery, she had to have um, something called a bridge. It was something to keep her blood thin so that she didn't have blood clots form on her heart valve. Well, the injection sites in her abdomen ballooned up overnight, and she had hematomas this big in, in her abdomen. And she was in blinding, excruciating pain. Just terrible, awful pain. The pain meds that we had been given for her surgery didn't touch it. When she went for her following orthopedic sur uh, uh, appointment on that, the, the following Monday, the orthopedic nurse, in conjunction with the cardiac folks, got her down to the emergency room immediately. They gave her two shots of something called Dilaudid, which is 10 times more powerful than morphine, and it didn't touch the pain. Beloved of God, I want you to know, for those three or four days, I couldn't do anything to help my wife. It was the hardest thing I had ever, ever experienced in my life. I have never felt so helpless. I prayed. I asked God to help me carry some of the pain, to transfer some of the pain to me so it would lessen her pain. I prayed that God would 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 allow her some measure of comfort by me just holding her hand. We didn't sleep for four days. She couldn't sleep. We couldn't sleep. There wasn't anything we could do to alleviate her pain. <coughs> I have never been in such a wilderness in my life. When I'm talking here about fear and doubt, that's the kind of moment that I'm talking about this morning. If you haven't faced it, you are going to come to a wilderness experience in your life where when you pray, you wonder if your prayers are being heard. And it's going to be difficult. So, this morning we are going to look at where is Jesus in the storms of our life? And how can we address those moments of difficulty? And, and beloved, I don't know what that difficulty is going to be. It might be something with your career. It might be something with a relationship. It could be finances. It could be your health. It could be something with your family. I, I, I don't know what that's going to be. But you're going to come to one of those wilderness experiences. And I would like, as best as I can this morning, to prepare you for how to approach those times in your life where your faith is stretched to the place where you think it's going to break. I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8.
We're going to spend quite a bit of time this morning on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was a place where the disciples didn't particularly like. They would go out a little bit on the Sea of Galilee, but the Jewish people at that time had a cultural fear of the deep. They thought that the deep was the realm of demons. And then on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee was the realm of demons and pigs and everything unclean. And it's interesting to me how many times Jesus takes the disciples back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. So here we go on the first trip. Now when he had got into the boat, that's Jesus, this is verse 23, the disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But Jesus was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said, why are you fearful? Key phrase, O oh, you of little faith. Why are you fearful? O oh, of you, O oh, oh, you of little faith. And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, so that the men marveled, saying, Who can this be? that even the winds and the sea obey him. So here we have a mighty storm that just suddenly arose on the sea. There is a word in the Greek that says that, the, the, that there was a seismic shaking of the sea. That's how bad the sea was being shaken by the wind. And the waves were covering the boat. Have you all ever been in a boat that was covered with waves? I was out on Lake Erie one time, and the waves came up. Lake Erie is a very shallow lake, and we were up there walleye fishing. And we were doing fine. We weren't catching any fish, but we were out there pretending to fish. And we were having a good time. And we decided to go someplace else and look at the way the wind came up and all of a sudden there were four to six foot waves on a fourteen foot Boston whaler. Now the guy that I was with, some of you know, he he, he said, Don't worry, this boat's unsinkable. I wasn't worried about sinking. I was worried about can I see over the next wave? We couldn't see where land was. We couldn't see anything. All you could see was the waves. And so we charted a course and we were going wham, 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 wham across those waves. That was an unpleasant experience. <clears throat> but the boat wasn't covered with waves. Here the boat was covered with waves. It probably was taken on water. And the disciples were afraid. They thought they were going to die. And remember, these disciples were probably young men. Some of them may have been teenagers or in their early 20s. And so they went down to get their master. And Jesus uses a word that is unique to his disciples the first time. He calls them little faiths. <coughs> In the Greek, it's oligopistoi. Some of you may have heard of the word oligarchy. The rule by few. He calls them little faiths. And it's used by our Savior only of his disciples. It appears in Matthew's Gospel at least four other times. And on the surface, it appears to be a reference to the quantity of their faith. Just a little faith. But these were the disciples. These were people who had already accompanied Jesus in his ministry for many, many months. They had seen him work miracles. And so it's curious 
that he uses that word only of his disciples. I wonder why he does that. What does he mean when he calls them little faiths? Well, when in doubt, the best thing to do is go to other passages of Scripture that have the same word, right? So why don't we travel over to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, we find the disciples in a boat again, crossing the Sea of Galilee in a storm again. And so let's pick up the story in verse, uh, verse 22. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he sent them, uh, and, 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 and while he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountains by himself to pray. And now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And now it was in the fourth watch of the night, in the middle of the night, and Jesus went to them walking on the sea, walking on the sea, and the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. These are the disciples, okay? These are people who are afraid again. They're out in the sea again, and they see somebody walking out on the sea. Have any of you seen anybody walking out on the lake? Neither have I. So let's give the disciples a little bit of a break here, okay? It's okay to be fearful if you see somebody walking on the water. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter rises to the occasion, and he says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. How about that? Peter was a water walker for a minute. That was a great thing, right? Peter's out there walking on the water. But, oh, you hate those conjunctions. But when he saw the wind was bolsterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him those magic words, say them with me. Yeah. Say them. Oh, say them. Come on. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? <coughs> Little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. By the way, how did Peter get back to the boat? Jesus picked him up and they walked together to the boat. Right? Unless Jesus dragged him through the water, he could have done that. This is Peter, the chief of the disciples. 
It's very curious to me that this is the man, the only other man that we see in Scripture who walks on water that Jesus calls a little faith. He calls him a little faith. And he says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I wonder what's going on. Why would Jesus call the person who is going to help lead the formation of the church in the New Testament a little faith? Here's another hint that Jesus may not be talking about the amount of faith. But we still have a couple more passages to take a look at. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, we find Jesus confronting the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And after this confrontation, here they go again back across the lake. Only there was no storm this time. The disciples were breathing easy a little bit. And so Jesus attempts to warn them about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And let's take a look beginning in verse chapter or verse 5 of chapter 16. And now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. In other words, they forgot to bring their lunch. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so here the disciples, they started talking among themselves. They said they reasoned among themselves. This was a discussion, all right? What did Jesus mean about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? It's because we have taken no bread. That was their conclusion. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. While Jesus was referring to the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the disciples were thinking in a completely different direction. They completely missed it. They thought he was telling them that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were kosher bakers and that they were supposed to stay away from their sandwiches. Probably had ribs also. No, they didn't. <laughs> they thought that they were supposed to bring their own lunch the next time. That was the conclusion that they came to based upon Jesus' warning. But he was referring to the teaching of these religious leaders. And he makes reference to the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And he asks, how is it that you still don't understand little faiths? Here's the word again, little faiths. Here's another clue. Based on what the disciples had witnessed in Christ's ministry, there was something that they should have learned that would have informed them as to what Christ was referring to in this passage. They should have known that he was referring to the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but they missed it. And why did they miss it? Because they were little faiths. They were little faiths. They came to an unimaginative conclusion. 
Jesus could not have been talking about bread because they had already seen him in the miracle of the 5,000 and the 4,000. How did they miss that? How did they miss that? So here we have another clue that Jesus is not talking about quantity of faith. But we have one more <coughs> passage of scripture to take a look at. Let's go over one more passage to, to chapter 17. Chapter 17. In chapter 17, Peter, James, and John are up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And they're seeing <coughs> Christ in all of his glory. They've been told not to say anything about what they saw. But there, the heaviness of God's glory was revealed to those three so that they could understand who Jesus is without question. So they're coming down off of this retreat of sorts, and the rest of the disciples have been trying to, to do ministry in Jesus' name by casting out a demon and a boy. And so let's pick it up in verse chapter or in verse 14 of chapter 17. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he falls into the fire and often into the water. And so I have brought him to your disciples. Can you hear that in his voice? I have brought it to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And Jesus is starting to get a little frustrated. Okay? You can hear this in his voice. And he says, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said, because of your, the word in your Bibles may be unbelief, but it's all your pistis, because of your little faith. Because of your little faith. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move it from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. When the disciples asked what was going on, these disciples were thinking that they had some sort of We'll call it divine magical ability to cure people. They thought that they had it resident within themselves to do it. And so they were doing everything that they had seen Jesus do in the past, and they just thought that they could do it in and of their own ability. Did it work? Nope. It didn't. The disciples were frustrated. The man who had was at his wit's end. I mean, you can imagine that this man had been going to many places for years trying to find something to help his son. And now they have a bona fide healer in their midst and his disciples are there and he brings them to him and he says, please cure my son. And the disciples couldn't do it. 
Thankfully, Jesus shows up on the scene and he cures them. And why can't they do it? Jesus says, because you're little faiths. Jesus finally states that it's not the quantity of faith which is important. It's the quality of faith. This only comes by prayer and fasting. In Matthew 14, Peter took his eyes off the object of his faith, Jesus, for anything is possible. He focused on his precarious position and what he was doing and reverted to his own abilities, one which is not walking on water. He tried to do it in his own power. In Matthew 16, they reverted back to their old fleshly human ways of understanding rather than relying on the revelation that they had seen and witnessed from God as Jesus fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. And now here in Matthew 17, they trusted in their own abilities again to try to cure this demoniac, this epileptic of this problem. So what are we supposed to take from this this morning? When we come up against places where we're filled with doubt, where we have issues, where our faith is flagging, where it's faltering, where it's failing, how are we supposed to address this? If it's not the quantity of our faith, how can we grow in our faith to meet the challenge? Faith is the response of the whole person to the revelation of God. Faith is the response of the whole person to the revelation of God. It is the quality of our faith that is being challenged here. There is a story about Socrates. Maybe some of you have heard this story. Socrates, in his day, was a highly revered teacher. And there was a young boy who wanted to become one of his disciples, wanted to become a student of Socrates. He was only about 12. Socrates had set up camp by a lake, and the boy was sitting on a hill, and he was listening to Socrates teach his students. And every day he got a little braver, and he came down the hill a little farther so that he could hear more of what this great man was teaching. Finally, one day, he had the courage, and he went up, and he asked Socrates, can I be your student? Socrates was a big man, and he looked down at this boy, and he said, if you want to be my student, you come back here tomorrow. Summer. We said, okay, I'll be here. Boy was there the next morning. And it was just hitting Socrates. And he said, Do you desire to learn? And the boy said, Yes. And he said, Follow me. And so Socrates turned and went out into the lake. And they got about knee deep, and he turned around, and he looked at the boy, and he said, Do you desire to learn? And the boy said, Yes, I desire to learn. And Socrates said, Follow me. And so they walked on up until they got in over their waist. Socrates turned again and looked at the boy. Do you desire to learn? 
And the boy didn't know what else to answer. He said, yes, I desire to learn. And so he said, follow me. And so Socrates walked out until he was up to about his shoulders. But the boy's a little boy, and he's on his tippy toes. He's just barely able to keep his head above water. And Socrates looks at the boy and he said, do you desire to learn? And the boy said, yes. And Socrates took his big hands, put them on the boy's shoulders, and shoved him under the water. And the boy's thinking, man, this is an interesting first day at school. Isn't it? <laughs> Socrates held him there. And after a few seconds had gone by, Socrates was holding him, the boy's lungs started to burn. And Socrates wouldn't let go. And so the boy started thrashing around and, and, and doing everything he could. And he finally broke free. And he came up out of the water and he gasped for air and he said, What are you doing? And Socrates said this, he said, when you desire to learn the way you desire to breathe, then you can be my student. Beloved of God, this morning, do you desire God the way you desire to breathe? In your life, what part of your life belongs to God? How much of your life should belong to God? All of it, right? Every last shred. The problem is, we can't conjure up that kind of faith on our own. We can't do it. We just can't. So what are we supposed to do? We come up against these, these situations that we've never experienced before. We're praying to God and asking for His intervention. We're asking God, please help us. Where are you? David, over and over in the Psalms, you see him. Lord, why have you turned your face from me? Jeremiah went through awful tribulations and trials to the place where he says he was eating gravel, asking where is his God? What are we supposed to do in those situations where our faith comes smack dab up against our greatest fears, our doubts, and our faith is stretched to the place of breaking. We don't know if our faith is going to come out intact or not. What's going to happen? What are we to do? I want us to take a look at the same story of the father of the demoniac but from one other passage of Scripture. I love the fact that we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. They look at the same event with slightly different eyes. I'd like for you to turn over to one more passage this morning, to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. this up in verse um, 21. <clears throat> this is Jesus talking to the Father. 
after he had cured him. He said, how long has this been happening? And, and, and he said, from childhood. And often he had thrown him both into the fire and in the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on him and help us. <coughs> and Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And I love this man's response to Jesus. This is the same dad. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Listen to that. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He rebuked the spirit, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you. And the spirit cried and convulsed greatly and came out of him. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. This man said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. This is the raw, unfiltered cry of a heart that is caught between doubt and faith. Do you know that it's possible for both things to exist in our heart at the same time? And we see this man eloquently saying it, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. The duality of belief and unbelief, we'll call it faith and unfaith, is something that we face all the time. We face it all the time. But God does not demand perfect faith. He responds to this man who had imperfect faith with compassion. Did he tell the man, come back when you believe better, and then I'll heal your son? Did he say that? No. No. He went ahead and healed him. When the disciples were in the boat, and it was covered up with waves, did he tell them, go back up, have a prayer meeting, and when you all got it together with your faith, come back, and then I'll take care of the waves? Nope, he didn't say that. He responds to us with compassion the same way he responded to this man here. In our journey of faith, we've got to learn to be honest with God. He is not repelled by our questions. He's not repelled by our doubts. He invites us into his presence where our unbelief can be transformed into a deeper, more resilient faith. And in the end, it's not our strength of faith that sustains us. Whose strength is it? It's God's strength, right? You know something? We are weak. We're dust. We're little pieces of flotsam in God's grand universe. We don't have any strength of our own. And it's folly to think that we can. I am sitting here this morning because I no longer have the strength to stand up there. And I'm going to tell you before God that for a large portion of my life, the way I got through life was just to stick my head down and pull my way through things in my own strength. Just getting from one thing to another, task to task. And finally, about four years ago, the Lord sat me down, boom. And he said, big boy, I don't want you living this way anymore. 
and he took my health away from me. He did. I was looking at dialysis. I was looking at the need for kidney transplant. I was in terrible pain. I was slushing around to the place where I had, I was well over 400 pounds. I was full of fluid. My legs were huge. And I didn't know if I was going to live or not. My wife and my mom were preparing for me to die. I hope that the Lord does not have to do the same thing to you that he has had to do to me. I'm a stubborn, foolish person. Thank God that he spared me. Thank God that he is a merciful God. But I'm going to tell you, I was scared. I was scared. I was scared five weeks ago this weekend with Barb. I thought I was going to lose her. I didn't know what I was going to do if I lost my wife. It's okay to be challenged in your faith. You know the great thing is even when we lack faith and even when we're faithless, God is faithful with me. Isn't God faithful? Amen. What did I hear Robert say this morning? All to the glory of God? Amen. So, dear brothers and sisters, In your walk, in the wilderness of suffering and pain, in the wilderness of uncertainty, in the places when you call out at night and you wonder if God hears you, the answer to that question is always yes. The answer is that he has never left you or forsaken you. He is always your Emmanuel. He is always God with you. And it is never that God is less good in some times than other times. God is always good. All the time, God is always good. God is always faithful. That never changes despite our circumstances. In those moments where your faith and experience separate, ask the Lord in that sacred space right here. This is holy ground. This is where the Lord is going to grow your faith and make you more like Him and help you to understand Him better help you have a deeper understanding of who he is. And just like Job in Job 38, you will find your sufficiency in him. I do not know who I'm speaking to this morning, but I think that at some point you all are going to go through a wilderness experience like this. And in the midst of that, say, Lord, I believe, but help me and believe. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we are weak, frail, finite, fragile people. Lord, sometimes our arrogance is just beyond belief. Sometimes, Lord, we're so prideful in thinking we can do things in our own strength that somehow, Lord, our achievements are our own. That somehow what we have accomplished is through our own effort. Lord, we have done nothing. 
It is all a good gift from you. Lord, in the moments when we are, are weak, Lord, when we are full of doubt and fear, when we don't know what's going to happen, when we get lab results back from the hospital that scare us, it fills us with fear. When something happens to a loved one, Lord, and we're uncertain of how this is going to turn out. When marriages don't go the way we think they should and there's strain in relationships. When careers, Lord, are, are, are in jeopardy. When we worry about how we're going to put bread on the table, how we're going to keep a roof on our head, how we're going to provide for those who depend on us. Lord, for all of the things that, that inhabit the realm of the unknown, in these times of doubt, when our faith is stretched, Lord, we pray that you would be a help to us, that you would help our unbelief, that you would allow us to turn our eyes to you, and that, Lord, that you would strengthen us, and that, Lord, that you would answer us and show yourself great and mighty, and that everything that is done in our life might be done to your praise and to your glory and to your honor. We thank you, Lord, for this man in Scripture who knew his limitations. Lord God, who turned to you even in his unbelief, and he was so honest. He was genuine and he was authentic. Help us to be the same with you. Help us to be honest before you. Help us not to erect facades. Help us not to even fool ourselves. Lord God, help us to be genuine before you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Jesus, we want to thank you so much for the opportunities that you have given us, Lord, to sing to you, Lord, to hear the preached word, uh, praising how strong you are in comparison to our weakness. Lord, we want to thank you so much for our brother Patrick, our brother Patrick this morning as he shared, uh, Lord, his life and also he shared with the scriptures, Lord, this, this wonderful, powerful Savior who is able to do greater than we can even imagine. Lord, I just pray that we will continually remember the one who gives us our breath 